Hello, I'm the Dark Master, and welcome back to the Kirby Right Back At You Retrospective. In today's episode, we shall be covering episode 21, A Princess in Distress, or as it's known in the Japanese original by the spoilery name, Princess Rona's Holiday. This episode was originally released in Japan on February 23rd, 2002, as the 21st episode, whereas the English dub released it as a 19th episode on November 16th, 2002, likely due to the rearrangement of other episodes, rather than anything wrong with the episode itself. Now, let us start with the plot. The episode opens to a shot of a fairy tale book. And I gotta say, while this is a really small, meaningless detail, it is a surprising little touch. The various colored cappies are a reference to the color palette swaps of enemies that are in the game. And the prince and princess are actually kind of well designed for what are essentially random non-characters. Regardless, we hear Tiff explain a classic fairy tale of how the prince and princess fell in love and lived happily ever after. She asks her brother what he thinks, as Kirby is mesmerized by the storybook. Her brother is less enthused, saying the book is a load of bunk. That's all made up, like all fairy tales are. Tiff counters by saying all fairy tales are meant to not be like real life, which is a fair statement that many should know. Their conversation is interrupted by the arrival of their parents as Sir Ibram runs in, clasping a scroll. He says they got some exciting news as Ladylike explains that a princess is coming to Capitown. Tuff is skeptical slash shocked as Sir Ibram declares Princess Rona will be arriving soon, and the pair run off to prepare. Tuff says this is awesome, which causes his sister to call him out on his alleged hypocrisy. He then explains a real princess is more exciting than a storybook one. Kirby looks at the book confused, as we then see the intro. After the intro, we cut to King Diddy reacting in shock to the news about Princess Rona, as delivered by Escargoon. Upon hearing the news, the king falls head over feet in love with her, despite not knowing who she is as a person or what she looks like. Actually pretty open-minded, so I'll give him that, but no less stupid. Interestingly, in the Japanese original, her home planet, PP, is mentioned, but that was removed from the English dub. I kinda wonder why. Escargoon tries to warn him about how she might not be available, but the king ignores him, saying there's no other reason for her to come here. Now, apparently, democratic meetings between different planets don't exist here, despite the advanced technology. He throws the snail away and tells him to prepare. After an outside shot of the castle, we see Waddle Dee's cleaning the castle in all manner of ways. We also see Ladylike and her daughter Tiff arranging potted plants as Cerebrum accidentally hits a DDD totem over when he tries to put on some abstract piece of art. The Waddle Dees are then seen preparing plates and food while Tuff watches. We then see the horrid Takori bird 
alerting the citizens of Capitown about the arrival of Princess Rona. The mayor is amazed at the news, while Police Chief Bookums is concerned about gridlock, whereas Kawasaki is just excited at the arrival of a princess. Decoy tells him to stop bickering and prepare for the crowd, and we see the first of the notable changes between the versions. In the Japanese original, while the Kepis are preparing, there are no spoken lines, just the background music. The English dub adds a line of a young child saying, Daddy, I can't wait for the princess. While this change might annoy some people, I think it does help to indicate the fact that there's actually a, you know, a group of people around. It's a positive change overall. One thing not so positive is that this scene has some censorship. You see, in the Japanese original, there's a banner that reads popcorn, which was airbrushed out in the English dub. Why is this the case? It's not kanji or English. It's perfectly fine English. Why would you even waste the manpower editing that out? And this isn't the only example of this. The camera then cuts to a large banner and a distant shot of Castle DDD with fireworks. In the Japanese original, the huge yellow banner has the phrase, Welcome Princess Rona, printed in patriotic red, white, and blue. This was also airbrushed out of the English dub. Again, I must ask why. I mean, it's not kanji or anything. And why remove it? I mean, like, it actually harms the feeling of the scene. It's such a waste of time and effort. Why, why even waste your time removing that? And this banner is in multiple scenes, too, so you know they had to do it a lot. After a zoom in on the castle, we cut to the roof, where we see King Dedede, Escargoon, Ladylike, Sir Ibram, Tiff Tough Kirby, and a welcoming party of Adelies. We then see a strange egg-shaped UFO float down and land in front of the group, which are in awe at the sunlight glimmering off the hull. The ship opens, and the group looks as they see a figure emerge. This is Commander V, or as she's far less grandly called, the Personal Guard V in the Japanese original. Voiced in the Japanese original by Madoka Akita, who also voiced in some obscure anime like Serial Experiment Lane. She's voiced in the English dub by Tara Jane Sands, who apparently voiced Bulbasaur in Pokemon. In terms of appearance, I find it interesting that the series did its own take on the kind of conehead stereotypical aliens, but I'll save my thoughts on the character for the end. When Commander V is first seen, King Dede and Escargoon are clueless to who she is. In the Japanese original, they conclude she is a bodyguard, whereas in the English dub, they both assume she's the princess who happens to be a tomboy. Foreshadow. The others are awestruck, but then Commander V introduces Princess Rona, who is voiced by Tara Sands, also in the English dub, and she does a great job. In the Japanese original, she's voiced by Yuko Sasamto, who's also worked on a bunch of obscure anime, like Gatekeepers. The performance in both versions is pretty good. But again, I'll save my thoughts on her for later, because let's just say there's a bit of a reveal later on. DDD instantly falls in love with the most feminine princess, Princess Rona Commander V, are greeted by Sir Ibram and Lady Like to Capitown. Commander V introduces herself as Tiff watches at them confused. Tuff says she's beautiful, while his sister calls him out on his hypocrisy. DDD then brushes past Cerebrum, and not understanding the idea of subtlety or tact, proclaims he is in love. In the Japanese original, Escargoon damage controls by trying to change the subject by offering the group tea. In the English dub, he feeds the king's bullheadedness by concluding he's in love. The two arrivals are shocked. As we cut to a shot of them all at a large table, as Cerebrum says, it's 
a rather modest meal. I disagree, but Princess Rona humbly thanks him. Tuff is amazed that a girl could be nice like Princess Rona. Tiff is a bit upset by her brother's statement, but then says she thought all boys were like Tuff, which kind of evens out the sibling abuse. Before she met Commander V, for the record, at this time, everyone thinks she is a he. Uh, we'll come back to this later. She gets embarrassed when she thinks Commander V heard her compliments. The commander walks over to her and greets Tiff, Tuff, and eventually Kirby. Though he initially thinks Kirby is some pink pet, Tiff clarifies he's a Star Warrior. Commander V apologizes for his mistake, though Kirby was asleep and is a baby, so acts friendly to V anyway. Also in the Japanese original, V mentions how similar her name is, which only makes sense in the Japanese original because there her nickname is B, and you know, Kabi, Kabi, and B, those names rhyme. Their interaction is cut short when King Dedede arrives. In the Japanese original, his entrance is silent, whereas in the English dub, they added his southern laugh. He carries a large clump of flowers and makes a statement. In the Japanese original, he asks her to dance with him later that night, whereas in the English dub, this is changed to him just wanting to spend time with the princess. Princess Rona politely thanks him for the offer, but Commander V steps in. In the Japanese original, he declines on the princess's behalf since it's against the rules for her to dance with someone so unsightly like the king. He then defers to Kirby about rules being rules and subtly reminds the princess to thank the king for his offer. In the English dub, this is changed to him saying it's getting late and that the princess is tired after a long trip, and thanks all of them on her behalf for everyone's hospitality. Escogoon's statements about pizza do little to change their minds. I will say that blue skies are visible from the windows, which kind of undermines this statement, but, you know, it's fine. She thanks Kirby as we cut to the king's throne room. There, he complains about Commander V cock-blocking him to Escargoon. The snail servant tries to explain to the king that it probably has more to do with his poor personality. Dee Dee ignores this and decides to practice his proposal, as we then cut to a stage located somewhere in the castle, where we see Waddle Dee's acting as crewman as Escargoon in a princess costume, helping Dee Dee, Dee practice his proposal. Dedede obviously talks in sloppy soliloquies, where Escargoon makes sexual moans in an attempt to pretend to be the princess. Then he jots down a timestamp for music to begin, as a wary Waddle Dee pushes a button and a disco ball appears. Terrible 70s music plays as Dedede sings horribly. Escargoon, despite trying his best to please the king, even he can't stand the king's bellows. In the Japanese original, he says that real life and plays are not the same thing, and uses that as an excuse to say DDD is trash, whereas in the English dub, he rates it a 4 out of 10, which means it's still better than Captain Marvel. Despite this harsh criticism, the king remains determined and declares, He will have her! Apparently not taking no for an answer. We then cut to the next day, where we see a crowd of cheering cappies, all excited at the princess as she politely thanks them all for the warm hospitality. As various citizens comment, in the Japanese original, they all take note of the princess's shy nature, while in the English dub the conversation is more varied. Chief Bookham says it's an honor to be here. Professor Kirio says she's the most beautiful princess they've ever had. Well, the mayor points out she's the only princess they ever had. I don't know. I guess the king, DDD, had no mom or anything. I mean, wouldn't his mom have been at some point a princess? 
I get this whole thing of King being the king of Cappies, but also a penguin is just weird. We then cut to Tiff, Commander V, and Kirby walking down a hallway. Tiff and the group talk about how DDD is in love with himself. And Commander V goes over to a carved statue to inspect it. Now, in the Japanese original, he does this intentionally because he's sick of the king's face. And so he wants to go over and punch it. Whereas in the English dub, this line is kind of removed. So Commander V goes over to the panel for no reason. Honestly, I don't really mind the removal, but I do think some people will. So Tiff tries to warn him, but fails, and the three fall down a secret tunnel. After some embarrassment, Commander V asks where they are, and Tiff explains that they're outside because of all the traps in the king's castle. V is surprisingly happy and says, A castle is boring. She heads down a flight of stairs to a little boat in the moat. Tiff asks, What about the princess? To which V explains, oh, She'll be all right. Foreshadowing more here. Ha ha ha. And she invites Kirby along as Tiff tags along as well. We then cut to Cappy Town. Tiff introduces V to the town's residents, who are all rather unimpressed with the mayor, going as far as to say, he's no Princess Rona. Tiff, of course, calls them out on their elitism and points out how important V is. But Commander V interjects and says he's fine because he would prefer people don't make a big deal about him. Foreshadowing. We then see Kirby doing what Kirby does, that being eating everything in sight, as he devours corn dogs and cotton candy, much to the chagrin of Tuggle and the mayor. V laughs at Kirby's bottomless hunger and asks if he can have some. The mayor says, sure, but... In the English dub, he says it's just junk food. V tastes it and loves it and asks Tiff what it is. She explains that it's cotton candy and asks the commander if he's ever had it before. He says no, then goes to pay the mayor. But he says it's all right since it's on the town. The group laugh and I'm honestly as confused as Kirby is in the scene. Interestingly, in the Japanese original, Commander V speaks with a sort of princely elegance that confuses Tiff, but this is com this subtext is completely removed in the English dub, which is why I didn't even mention it up to this point. We then cut to Tiff, Commander V, and Kirby fishing. Kirby hooks a fish, and the other two help him pull it in. And ooh boy, it's a big one. Amazed that the rod didn't break. They take the fish to Kawasaki, who offers to make sushi out of it. We then see Kawasaki make sushi, first removing the scales, then filleting it. Commander V compliments Kawasaki's skill, then he gives the group the sushi, and Tiff has to stop Kirby from eating it all. Commander V quickly grabs a piece, taps it in soy sauce, and eats it. He praises Kawasaki, who's just happy that someone likes his food for once. Next, we see the first scene change of the episode. By scene change, I mean a change in how the scene is handled, whereas opposed to, like, visual or audio changes. In the Japanese original, after Chef Kawasaki is praised by V for his sushi, Tiff comments on the fact that since... He spends his days with Princess Rona. He must be able to have luscious food very often. While this is subtly confirmed, he says that sushi is better since it wasn't forcefully elaborate. Though the chef is still great for the compliment, as he brings the two green tea. This whole scene was kind of removed from the English dub. It's kind of fine, but it's not really anything meaningful. After that scene, there is another change. The camera pans across a plane. In the Japanese original, 
The next scene shows how Commander V is calmed by the tranquil atmosphere Dreamland has to the point of wanting to live out his days there. Much to Tiff's happiness. This entire scene between the camera panning and Tiff's reminding the gang about what V has to do was completely removed from the English dub. As Tiff reminds V about the work he has to do, but Commander V says people should have as much fun as they can when they can. I can agree. Tough then arrives. Tiff asks what her brother is doing here. He explains he left because Princess Rona was so boring. Because all she said was, How interesting! In an uptight manner. Commander V laughs and explains that Princess Rona was trained to be as polite as possible. He says a princess life is boring and that it's like having no life at all. And he'd trade a life like Tiff for being a princess any day, leaving Tiff kind of confused at his sudden anger. The conversation is cut short by the rampage of a mad sheep as a beleaguered herder yells for it to come back. It runs pretty slowly, though, considering the kids, for the most part, keep away. But sadly, Kirby is not so lucky. Commander V then turns around, seeing Kirby in danger, and pushes him out of the way. We see the sheep run away, chased by the herdsmen, as Tiff and Tuff run over to check if the two are okay. But then, there is a Kirby, review. are you okay? Yes, it turns out that Commander V is actually Princess Rona in disguise. Dun, dun, dun. Now, some have said this twist is a ripoff of Roman holidays. And while, yes, the Japanese name for this episode was an intentional reference to that obscure movie that nobody's probably watched, Honestly, it's more likely to be based off the classic book, The Prince and the Pauper, written by the overrated but talented Mark Twain. When Tiff asks for an explanation, a saddened Princess Rona looks down with remorse. We then have a commercial break as we see Kirby grabbing for fish. Rona explains herself when Tiff asks, as a princess, she can't enjoy life like a regular person, and Tiff kind of repeats this so the audience can understand. In either case, the two kids and Kirby are great to keep Rona's secret. It even say they'll show her around, but Rona declines their offers because, while she would love to stay a few days with her new friends, soon she will have to leave and return back to her home planet. Plus, she's worried that people will learn of the ruse she's played on everyone. We then cut to Castle DDD, where we see Sir Ibram and Lady Like talking to Commander V. For the record, since this twist is revealed, I'm going to try to refer to these characters how they're referred to and who they actually are. But I might get mixed up a bit. My, understand that this is... Uh, mistake and i'm not a perfect human being this conversation is cut short when waddle dees close the shades and dim the lights as a light appears and ddd jumps on the table to start his proposal after doing several tricks and twirls including jumping on the table and breaking it he is tossed a microphone by escargoon while Waddle turns on a smoke generator as DDD begins with his horrible singing. He then asks the disguised Commander V to marry him. Both Sir Ibram and Lady Like are shocked by the king's brazen attempt, with Lady Like fainting as her husband catches her. Just as DDD proposes, 
they are cut short by the arrival of the real Princess Rona, who says that despite the king's persistence, the princess is not interested. DDD is, however, sick of the commander's interference and tells her to stay out of it. Then Rona tells the princess to speak for herself, and Commander V politely declines the king's offer. He is then left brokenhearted, his dreams shattered. Estragoon says the princess broke the king's heart. How exactly, I don't know. He doesn't have one. But the king is enraged at Princess Rona and challenges her to a duel. The English dub, a sound effect when the glove the king throws against Rona hits her face. It's one of those few additions that actually kind of works because the, the sound effect makes it seem like there's an actual impact. Ladylike faints again via reused animation when she hears the word duel, and Princess Rona accepts his challenge. We then cut to see the horrid bird Takori alerting Capitown residents about the duel between Commander V and the King. We then see another scene change between versions. When the Cappies are shown to be approaching the castle, there are zoom-ins at the stage at two different angles, one facing the judge of the competition and the other at an angle. The English dub removes the first angle shot, likely due to time restraints. We see the cabbies in the stand while Chef Kawasaki provides some food, trying to sell sushi. Good on him to take advantage of the situation. Sir Ibram tries to get Commander V to stop the king and the real Princess Rona from fighting, but she says she couldn't stop either from fighting the other, even if she wanted to. We then see Princess Rona cleaning her short blade as Tiff warns her that this is dangerous and maybe she should just tell the truth. Princess Rona says she'll tell the truth in time, but she wants to have fun and says she could handle King Dedede. Tiff says she's a princess, but Rona asks her to let her not be one for just a bit longer as Kirby watches. Princess Rona says when she returns home, she will ascend to the throne and become queen, and that when she is queen, she will have no fun at all. So she wants to have as much fun as she can now, and so she walks out into the arena where Cappy's watch in anticipation. Dedede comes out as well. He gets his large sword from Escargoon. It looks strangely familiar foreshadowing, as DDD trash talks Rona, to which she says, let the duel begin. The two fight at first, charging each other, and while initially even, eventually Rona manages to outclass DDD and eventually tires him out, which, I mean, having played the games, that's not exactly what would have happened, but oh well. She knocks the sword out of his hand, and King Dedede runs away back into the tent. As the crowd laughs at his expense, the mayor says King Dedede is more chicken than usual, but the king seems oddly happy, as he says it's time for the main event, and calls upon his secret weapon, and the monster of the week, Sushi. So this is Sushi, obviously his name is a pun on the Japanese food, Sushi. In terms of appearance, he resembles a really large eel with an unusually bloated body. I mean, seriously, this guy is almost as fat as Billy the Fridge. He is burgundy with a light purple belly with white scales and light green fins. In terms of abilities... He's a very simple physical beast. He can leap incredible distances despite his fat frame. He has very thick skin and can brush things aside with his tail. 
He has no voice actor, obviously, it's just generic kaiju sounds. While he is definitely one of the weaker anime-exclusive monsters, I think he has a sort of simple charm that would really make the transition into the Kirby games as a mini-boss. Honestly, even though it is admittedly a generic monster, I think it's actually an okay monster, and, I'll, and that's because... Usually, a simple monster can make the transition between the anime and the games real easy. DDD with deranged eyes says the duel will be more exciting now. Here we see the final scene change of the episode. When DDD reveals Sushi as Princess Rona's true opponent, Gengu says it's unfair. In the English dub, four kids added a zoom in of Sushi's face before Gengu's line, as well as a commercial break. Gotta get those money somehow. Dee, of course, reflects this by saying, when has he ever played fair? Which is a good argument. Estragoon warns him about the incoming harm, but the pair are crushed by Sushi's tail anyway. Sushi lunges at Rona, easily causing her to be pushed aside. Kirby, sensing his new friend in danger, runs over to help her. She tries to tell Kirby he's too small to handle Sushi, but he remains resolute as the pair dodge another attack. Kirby looks on, determined, as Sushi approaches. We then have some weird CGI effect of Sushi yelling slash breathing on Kirby, it's such an odd detail. It's not even an attack. It just is. Probably stinks, too. Kirby then tries to inhale the great beast. It's not very effective, as the huge eel is not only too big to be inhaled, it kind of just jumps out of the way, but Kirby keeps sucking. The king mocks Kirby's seeming stupidity, though he's not so amused when Etragoon points out that Kirby is actually not trying to inhale sushi at all but the king's sword who he had just left laying about nice way to mess up your own plans d d <laughs> yes so kirby has become sword kirby last seen all the way back in episode three so quite a long time, at least compared to Needle, which returned in like two episodes, back to back. I've covered this ability before, and I won't spend too much time on it, but let's just say it's well adapted from the games, and watch that previous video if you want more in-depth coverage. The crowd watching are amazed, as is Princess Rona. King DDD tries to call foul on Kirby's copy ability usage, but Tiff rebukes him, pointing out that the king's usage of monsters is also cheating. Kirby charges forward and strikes the mighty fish, knocking some scales loose. Tiff watches, worried that Kirby's attacks are not strong enough. Sushi's tail swipes Kirby all the way up to a balcony, but the pink puffball star warrior catches himself and goes right back into the fray. Princess Rona suggests they fight together. The great eel slams down again as they again dodge. Also an animation error. Here the scales are back, despite clearly being knocked off earlier. Tiff says the giant fish is a tough opponent, while Kawasaki suggests they try to make him into sushi. Sushi turns around to slam the duo as the others flee. Also, now the scales are gone again. Both Kirby and Princess Rona, however, now have a strategy. The pair run along either side of the fish's tail, and it is unable to choose which of the pair to attack. The pair then slice down, and, well, nothing seems to happen at first. Unaware of anything, Sushi tries to once again slam down on the pair. However, it is revealed that they, in fact, cut its tail clean off 
and two huge chunks of flesh smother the king in escargoon. And Chef Kawasaki remarks that he didn't know the king liked sushi. The bones of Sushi's tail evaporate when they touch the ground for some reason, and the now crippled Sushi launches off to some unknown fate. We actually never see him die or get defeated, but considering he's essentially helpless now, I think it's a safe assumption that he got cooked by Kawasaki off screen. This is strengthened by the chef offering the two warriors to work at his restaurant anytime. The entire town cheers the two's success as Princess Rona congratulates Kirby on his honor. But the celebration is cut short by the arrival of a bigger UFO. An old man and two guards arrive. In the Japanese original, he's her grandfather, which, if that's true, why would she have to, like, take the throne? Aren't there probably other relatives that could take the throne if she wanted to step down or whatever? In the English dub, it's not outright stated, and he's more implied to be a royal advisor. He says that, surely, she's not doing another disguise, revealing that this has happened before, and unintentionally revealing to everyone the trick. Chief Bookums and the mayor are utterly confused as Princess Rona explains then apologizes for how she and her lady-in-waiting tricked everyone. The royal advisor, clearly very tired, as you can tell from his voice, asks the princess if she's finally had enough excitement for a while. She's not so subtly says that they'll finish it later. The crowd laughs as Tuggle remarks that it seems Kawasaki won't be catering the king's marriage. The reaction D.D. has to the news has changed between versions. In the Japanese original, he moans about the fact that he almost married a guardswoman. And Eskilun says the marriage is off, whereas in the English dub, he says he's empty and he feels terrible. In which Eskilun says, just do what he normally does and have like seven cheeseburgers. Who is this guy, Billy? We then cut to Sunset, where we see Princess Rona and the others about to leave. She presents Kirby with the greatest award her country gives to heroes, essentially a purple heart, but she says that that's too formal and instead simply gives Kirby a kiss, and Kirby is happy regardless because he's an innocent baby. The group wave goodbye as both Princess Rona and Commander V both leave in their spaceship. Here we see the final script change between versions. In the Japanese original, Tiff says in an inner monologue, that she admits she may never understand the restricted lifestyle royalty may lead, but she vows never to forget her time with the princess. The English dub removes this monologue completely. On one hand, removing the dialogue does make the scene more grand and kind of sad, but on the other hand, I think the monologue was pretty great. You know, especially with the music, and both versions are fine. Honestly, it could go either way. Tuff is saddened by them leaving, and the episode ends with an old-fashioned picture of Tiff, Kirby, Princess Rona, and Tuff during their time at the cotton candy stand. The Japanese original, when the star iris wipe closes, there's a camera snap sound effect. Sadly, this was removed from the English dub, and I have no idea why. Anyway, let us cover the positives and negatives and my final thoughts. Firstly, I want to say that Princess Rona is without question the best one-off character in the show. And I say that I am really saddened that she never came back. I mean, there was a cameo in episode 64, the Kirby quiz, but that's a clip show. It doesn't count. The way the episode uses Sword Kirby was also very creative. 
in the sense that they didn't just cut the monster in half like they did with Bugsy and a lot of the other monsters. In fact, as we go forward, you'll see that a lot of times Sword Kirby just defeats foes the exact same way by cutting them in half. The fact that Sushi was defeated in a different way is pretty good. And speaking of Sushi, while not the most exciting design-wise, he's a perfectly average monster and could definitely make the transition to the games really well if they wanted to. I thought the plot was also pretty good, even if, yes, the twist was obvious to people. I mean, they shared the same voice actor in the English dub for Pete's sake. But while simple and didn't subvert any expectations, to quote Ryan Johnson, it was pretty good. But I did have some negatives. Firstly, while Princess Rona is a very strong character, I cannot quite say the same for Commander V. Now, that's because Commander V doesn't really do anything, and that's kind of the joke. But really, it wasn't all that impressive. And secondly, I think the censorship in this episode was, like, so stupid. Any censorship is bad, and I've never really been okay with it. Though I've understood it in the past, but here, it's like, what the heck? I mean, like, it's literally just English words. Like, why would you remove that? They're not kanji, they're not English. They're actually English, and they make sense within the context. Why would you remove that? Second, I think they reused the ladylike fainting. Was a bit lazy. I mean, come on. My third criticism, however, is the most complex, so I'm going to have to explain this. Now... As we all know, the LGBT community is an interesting group, and for the record, LGB representation is perfectly fine as an artistic choice. However, a disturbingly large amount of people in that community have, it in their great wisdom, decided that the friendship between Tiff and Princess Rona makes them lesbians or whatever. Secondly, I would like to point out that Tiff... Only has a crush on Commander V, Princess Rana, whatever, when she thought that he was a boy. When she discovers the truth, her romantic interest is just completely gone and is instead replaced with a general friendship. I swear, you people think that everything's about sex. As if basic friendship is an alien concept to you people. Which, I mean, I'm not surprised, but seriously... Also, last but not least, of which, these are both canonically children. So the fact that you guys are, like, so obsessed over their sexuality is kind of creepy. I mean, it's kind of like how Missy Ann talks about how her trans daughter, to such a creepy extent, even when it's completely irrelevant. Now, it's a, just weird. Now, if you want some actually valid representation, just stick to King Dedede and Escargoon, especially in the Japanese original. There is so much subtext there that, like, you know, you can interpret it. Now, I don't because I don't, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. But, and I think that they're straight too, but they're actually adults, so this kind of fan fiction is not creepy. In conclusion, I think this was a pretty good episode, and I would recommend you watch it. It's definitely not gold or platinum, but it's definitely high-grade silver. I am the Dark Master, and join me next time on the Kirby Right Back At You Retrospective. Have a great day, everybody.